two of the substrands um, we're going to talk about here. One is the concepts about print substrand. And it doesn't show up too much here, um, but the first three bullets are not bolded, and the last four are. So if you look at the strategies in the concepts of print um, substrand, Page 30? Okay, thank you. Page 30. <laughs> um, there are some items, the first three, that really say, you know, put environmental print out there, put props out for children to, you know, in center's time to support plus. And then there are the other four that have the teacher using environmental print, reading environmental print, using it as a tool to get things done. There should be some signs in the classroom and things like that. Um, using print, children's names, and some other things uh, in teacher-led activities. And then writing down interesting words is there as well. But here, here's, our here's the issue in terms of research with environmental print. A long history now, starting in 1984 with Lene Airy, uh, Mason Heimer and Airy group, looked at environmental print. <laughs> took it out of its familiar context, and children had no idea what the print said, of course, even when it was manipulated in this context. So you change letters, say, instead of Pepsi, it was Zexy or something like that. Um, they didn't notice. So, you know, and just fast forward even to more recent um, people who've looked at environmental print in children's, um, whether they actually focus on the print, uh, Jim Christie and Billy Ann's from um, Arizona, and um, Ray Ritzel from Utah have done some really good work. And Leah McGee and uh, Rich Gales did a study also a couple, uh, 15 years ago. But the message is always the same. Um, children really do not learn much, if anything, about print, letter ID, phonological awareness, print conventions, from engaging with environmental print either in the environment, outside the classroom, or in the classroom. Okay, we know that. So it's used to say in the old days, surround them by print and everything will be okay. It won't be okay. Um, now, that print is important though in the classroom. Very important. Because children do use it, they create it, as you know, and I love dramatic play. And it's so interesting to watch the variations in dramatic play. Children who can perfectly well write their names, uh, write alphabet letters, recognizably, you know, I'm taking a phone message or it's an invitation, it's all scribble. Because I don't really need the real thing. I mean, it's an artifact. I need it to play. If I, if I took the next 20 minutes to write it so you could read it, I wouldn't have time to play. So, um, <laughs> so dramatic play is interesting. They know um, the function of print is what we get from environmental print and print props. All the different uses. And actually, if you look, even look at their scribble writing, a grocery list will be kind of in a list form as opposed to an invitation or a letter. So they know a lot of things about the formatting, organization, and environmental print in different contexts. And they interact with it in a socially appropriate way. And that's important for motivation and for children to sort of get the feel of you know, how print is used. And the same would apply to their reading of predictable textbooks or even their retellings of narratives, which are not a predictable text, but the children pretending to read. It's important stuff, really important stuff. But we need to be clear that children do not learn much about print. They probably don't even look at the print much <laughs> in those contexts. And that's where the other substrand becomes really important. And one of the things that, uh, on this first slide from that other substrand, I pulled out the items that kind of loop back and use environmental print. And I include children's names in the classroom as environmental print and signs you would have on the walls, that kind of thing. So I wanted to loop back and in this, in the alphabetics and word, recognition, word and print recognition substrand, I wanted to make sure that environmental print was used. Because if it is, in situations where we are pointing out those print features, it's very likely that when children then, over time, are interacting with environmental print, they will start using the print and looking at the print. And Jim Christie's work from Arizona, Billy Ends, what they've done is actually remove environmental print from that context. So they make puzzles out of the Cheerios box and the Cheerios, and they, um, 
do matching games so that they're sensitizing children to the print that's actually an environmental context. And they're finding that children pay more attention to the print, the environmental print, and engage with it more when they do this. So now that won't do it uh, completely either, and we need some very specific alphabet activities. But just to, uh, and there was a little bit in terms of feedback there for a while of, wait a minute, this is, this is uh, concepts of print substrand, it's not the alphabetics and uh, word print recognition substrand. So I was kind of merging them to some extent, but the reason was I felt that if I completely separated them and didn't put some of the more, um, like those bold-faced ones, where the teachers really use the environmental print, um, I didn't do that. And if I didn't, on the other hand, in this substrand, put some uses of environmental print, we might lose what we were trying to do here. So um, that's the, the basis for it. And then we also have in uh, the alphabetics and word print recognition, you know, alphabet activities, games, that kind of thing uh, on its own terms. It doesn't inv involve environmental print. So I just wanted to, um, how many of you are familiar with the environmental print research? that's gone on now for all those years, yeah. So I run into quite a bit of um, still um, high faith in the value of environmental print and that children learn to read that way. And so and we just, we need to put that to rest. It just, it's not, but I, I do want to stress that it is so important to have that environmental print around. It's so important to have predictable books for children to pretend to read. And if we're lucky, and some of these more particular things take hold. Near the end of the preschool year, we're seeing some very different interactions with the environmental print, where children are actually looking at the print, using the print, um, in ways that they wouldn't if they didn't bring these skills to, to those contexts. Okay, now, um, let's go with alphabet learning. You might have noticed that in, um, the uh, alphabetics and word print recognition uh, substrand. We are pretty, as um, some people said, not California, but others, pretty loosey-goosey when it comes to alphabet letter um, teaching and learning. And by that they mean, they think they mean it's not systematic. That, you know, you haven't specified which letters are the hardest, need to be hit the most, which ones you would start with, and we didn't. And the reason we didn't, um, the research base for that, a couple. And there's a great new uh, dissertation out of, I think, University of South Florida. Um, oh, what is her name? Shane Piasta. It's all about alphabet letter learning. It's the most detailed. She just hit it from every angle. Um, but the upshot is, we know from going clear back to the research by uh, Eleanor Gibson on visual perception, that highly confusable letters, uh, E and F, for example, uh, or T and L, uh, and Gibson had what's called the Gibson tree, which just had two categories at first, uh, letters that had all curved lines and letters that had straight lines, and then uh, breaking off uh, from those until you finally get down to all 26. And so the highly confusable ones are the last to differentiate. Now, um, this it, this is a domain of learning. Now you hear the sort of cognition part of me coming in here. This is a domain of learning that benefits tremendously from comparison. In other words, if I could just see e and, e and F together, you know, of course they do come one after the other in the alphabet, so if you're doing a letter of week, I guess net, you know, but, but it needs to be better than that. These are comparative learning situations because these features are shared. So it's only when I compare the two uh, or I have a chance to, and see that, um, and it comes to my mind, or it's brought to my mind, that there's just one little difference between E and F. Can I begin to sort them out? And back to something else that, that really has an impact here. We're talking category learning. Uh, let's, let's think about that in the real world. And forks are my best example. Uh, and I have quite a large collection of forks I didn't bring with me, but I use for this. Forks vary by the length of their handles, I mean, think pitchfork to pickle fork, okay? And by the number of prongs, two to five, we call them all fork because the distinguishing feature of the category fork is that you have prongs and handle. 
and they can vary. So in many, many, many domains in the real world, we don't come up with a different name for variations, two prongs, three, four. The difference between an E and an F is one prong and a fork. Okay. So children go to this domain of learning early on thinking probably, and the behavior suggests it, that E and F are just different exemplars in the same category. I can call them, you know, pick my name if I want to say they're F's or E's, but they're two examples of the same kind of thing. Because that level of difference in the real world from which they come and still live, that difference doesn't matter. And if there's anything humans are good at, it's concept learning. That's where we get the power for our learning. Few exemplars, we've got the concept. We are masters, babies are masters. You can look at the uh, visual concept studies in infants, 10 months old. Give them a series of cats to look at on slides and you, you rotate them until they've habituated. And then the test phase, in other words, they're not looking anymore. It's like, okay, <laughs> I have that. The test phase, you divide the, the groups in half and you give one group a picture of a dog to look at and the other you give a cat that has not been in the habituation phase. And the theory is if they re-alert to what you show in the test phase, they're saying, hey, that's new. I haven't been looking at that. So what happens in these studies is the children who get the cat picture, they glance quickly, turn away, because babies are wired to go where the new information is. So like, oh, I've been looking at cats. Here's just another one. The children who have the dog to look at attend much longer. So we know that young babies are really great concept learners. You know, you see a few examples, you get the underlying similarities, you can now recognize another exemplar. That's what makes human learning powerful. And so we turn the tables on them in this domain. They come up to alphabet letters, all of a sudden, the rules are different. The rules are different. But children don't know that. So they're operating as they do on the real world. Okay, well, E and F, pretty close enough. O and Q, close enough. Same thing, what's the difference? Okay. Now, the fastest way to sort out and to communicate to them these in this domain, that's the difference, is to get those all on the table. Alphabet puzzle, <laughs> alphabet books, whatever you have that gets a lot of letters out there quickly. Um, so that was kind of the underlying research uh, instead of uh, going with, and, and I think as I talk to teachers who use a more systematic program, a letter of the week or whatever it is, they say, but I just want to make sure I cover everything. I want to make sure that I don't miss anything. I cover all the letters, and if I don't have some system, but I think you can have a system. You can have an assessment system, and you can change the bingo cards to make sure and how you group kids. So um, anyway, that's why it's as loose as it is. And it's a lot of exposure. Um, the strategies are really different contexts for exposing to alphabet letters, and I would get them all out there as quickly as I could. And I think it's time for our break. Okay. Although I, I do just have one really interesting story about this. Um, I have a bit like a little girl named Sarah who was in lab school many years ago. And she was three years old, three years and two months. And she had, had a babysitter and an older sister. And homework was big for her because her sister did homework. And so the babysitter was teaching her to spell her name, write her name. And her name was spelled S-A-R-A. -A. So one day I'm in the observation booth observing a student teacher at the writing table. And Sarah sits down with a piece of paper. And over in the upper right, left quadrant she writes, looks like, you know, some A's and some H's. Pretty much the same form, except the tops were open on some, so it looked like H's. So the student teacher, when she stops, uh, when Sarah stops, said, oh, those are great A's and H's. You've written so many. And Sarah glared at her, which was not her usual demeanor, and went right back to writing. She wrote another two rows over here, you know, A's and H's. And the student teacher, who's up so volume, said, oh, that's just great. You're such a and the glare was even worse. And this happened four, two more times, this quadrant and this quadrant, at which point Sarah picked up her paper, took it over to her take-home box, and went to do something else. So that conference with the student teacher, of course, right, she said, oh, I don't, know what, I don't know what I was doing wrong, and she was really in a bad mood, and so I, so I said, I saw that. <laughs> but I said, let's think about this. I'm wondering whether Sarah knows that H exists. Because if it didn't, we could leave the tops of A's open and A's would not be confused with any other letter. You see what I'm saying? There's no other letter. That's why what, what I call fancy E's. You know what I mean by that? These fancy E's, they put so because it's not confused with anything else. The minute you put a third line on an F, you're in E territory. You can't do that, and children don't do that. But the E's, I'm just going to add so many lines. 
And so if there were no H, uppercase H, you could be, you could be sloppy. So anyway, the, the lead teacher, we sort of set this up the next day, that you know, if you could get her over to the alphabet puzzles, if you could find out what letters she knows, because maybe she just knows S and A and R. So they got her over there, and sure enough, she didn't know anything about H's and no other letters except S and A and R. And you know, after that, she always closed the tops of her A's, even when she had to draw a separate line to close them. And so it was just a great example to me, that, that sort of aha, comparative learning. I'm not going to be too careful, or, or I don't even know what the parameters have to be, or the features have to be for any one letter, until I know more of the letters. That makes me pay attention, because I want to make sure you know it's an A in my name, and not an H. Okay, so just a great example from the kids. Okay, why don't we take a break? Um, so. Um, let me, a couple of people talked to me during the break and brought up very good things. Um, one was about uh, the comments I made about social emotional development and how that escalates and the indirect path is through teacher relationships and peer relationships. It's also the case, and from what I've been reading, um, it increases as time goes on, that lack of competence coming into school not knowing much in terms of some of the academic areas and thus not being able to engage very well also leads to frustration and aggression. So we've got, um, and, and over time that gets worse and worse. Um, so really we have two things that interact. Um, social emotional difficulties upon entry can create situations where uh, children aren't involved as much and don't engage as much in learning situations. And then we have situations where the uh, lack of skills also will make children socially, emotionally less engaging. So that's important. And uh, frankly, this area of research has not sorted these things out as well as it needs to. But I read a recent study, I think it was 2008, um, Child Development, I think it was Deborah Stye Picking Group, who were really trying to get a handle on these interactions and which comes first. And the truth of the matter is, even though something might come sort of first, very quickly, other things start feeding into those social emotional problems. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Now, um, I had a little discuss question after the alphabet letter uh, topic. So I think what I'd like to have you do, given that we are okay with time, is uh, maybe talk to your neighbor about alphabet learning and see if you have um, any questions you'd like to ask or any comments you'd like to make. Because I made some comments before the break about um, the environments, I mean the strategies we put in the um, curriculum frameworks and sort of the basis for those. Uh, but let's see what you think. So I'll give you just a few minutes to talk with one another. And okay, um, who would like to start with a question or a comment about letter alphabet letter learning? Yes. Can you stand up? There's a microphone as well. Okay. I'm new in this business with the preschool world. Um, not really, though. I've been a principal, and I've had a preschool on my sites both times. And now I'm over all of our preschools in our district. And my question is, we have an instrument called a DRDP. Have any of you heard that? <laughs> but um, I was going, I've been going through each of the items, you know, reflecting and looking at now, what's mastery? What should these children be able to demonstrate in order to show that they've gotten this. And when I looked at the ABC, the one on the alphabet, it speaks to the fact that um, students only need to 10 letters, you know, and, and teachers are coming in my office from the various schools, well, all they need to know, Dr. Thompson, is 10 letters, just 10 letters. And I'm sitting there seething going, don't you know of our gap? And well, that is not significant enough to move those children to a reading level at the end of first grade. And I just want to know, am I by myself in this challenge? No. 
if so, yeah. I think you know the ten. The that. ten, I think, came from the Head Start outcomes probably 15, 20 years ago, and there was such an uproar over ten. And of course, the question: Well, which ten? Which? But you know, but. Um, <laughs> You know, yeah, but I think some uh, for some reason that's and I don't know why it's still in the California. It's getting aligned, they say. But I think I, I'm I'm big now that I'm older, and more experienced and know more and and think back to 20, you know, when I didn't. I, I, I'm very um, historically sensitive and just you know we we do things in certain historical moments because it seems like a big step then. Looking back, it seems completely off base, but um, just some numbers here. If you look at middle income children, I think most of the studies we have of alphabet ID, we're talking entry to kindergarten, 24, 25, 26 letters, and lowercase letters. Okay. Yeah. Now, we also know that it's lowercase letters that we see in print, and if we don't get those pretty well in hand by first grade, I mean, imagine what it's like for a child trying to process words or trying to read in lowercase, figuring out what the letters are. You know, so we can't have that. So the numbers now, early reading first um, has kind of looked at the outcomes from their projects over the years. Everyone know what early reading first is? Okay. And they actually didn't set a benchmark, I think, in years one and two. And then, okay, and then they had 16, and now it's 19 because that's what the data are coming in from early reading first. Now, early reading first varies across the projects. And um, I know projects that have on average 25, 26 uppercase letters from four-year-olds by the end of the year and 20, 20, 21 up lowercase letters. So my own view is, and I, I don't, you know, I, I need to say this, we cannot uh, devote all of the preschool time to decoding skills. Language, language, language. Okay. <laughs> Having said that, we have to get serious about the decoding skills too because that's going to hurt children and hurt them first. We need to do both. But I, I said what I said about the time because I see time spent on the alphabet, the, the, I think it's pretty inefficient, and we could get a whole lot more done a whole lot faster. I mean, you know, and, and whatever. So I think, I think being smart with what we do and how we spend the time. But at least my understanding is, um, 1920 uppercase letters is not out of reach of preschool, and we need that. And I think, even the lowercase letters. And, and after all, I have to do a count in my head. But how many physical, visual matches do we have between lowercase and uppercase? I mean, O is the same, P is the same, T is the same. Teresa, you know off the top of your head how many? It's, it's, it's more than nine, isn't it? Well, but, okay, well, okay, okay. However, I'll go back to the infancy visual perception studies because I come from that background. And a fascinating study was done on um, geometric shapes. And these were like five-month-old babies. And so they had dots um, around, the per, you know, around the edges, and they distorted. Like, so a triangle would be distorted in different ways, and they showed them like five. Didn't show them an actual triangle as a habituation stimulus. They showed them the distortions of a triangle, a circle, a square. I think it was just those three. And then in the test phase, rather than showing another distortion, they showed them the well-formed triangle. Okay, So the children did not prefer the well-formed triangle in, uh, in, that, in those studies. They performed the, uh, uh, preferred the other distortion because the triangle the was the best sort of central average of the distortions. I mean, it's hard to follow this stuff. But anyway, we can trust, this I know, we can trust children to average over variations in items. They have no problem with different fonts unless we only give them one. Then they have a problem, just like in math. If they only see equilateral triangles, I can guarantee you on any assessment, if you have something other than an equilateral triangle, they're not going to pick it as a triangle because we have taught them there's only one form. Okay. So um, anyway, so I'm not a big one on how close because I think you know lowercase t, uh, uppercase t, so. Um, 
what are the others? F is close enough, is close enough for the typical child to average across and now you have to link them you can't leave it to willy-nilly you have to say that you know but it doesn't take very much in terms of um, linking those the way it does with B and B you know the ones that are completely different visual forms so I think you can have a lot of lower case um, knowledge as well going into kindergarten um, so I don't know what the numbers are that other people work with now and having said that I just you know, we do need to make sure we don't make children hate alphabet letters. Yes. And I see name writing, and this is I'm back to the NELP, you know, name writing is one of the best predictors. And I can just see it out there. Children will be practicing their names. Now, I think it's probably what all comes with the name writing. And probably there gets to be some association between the first letter in my name and how the first sentence. You know. So I think there's a lot probably in in the knowing how to write your name, that is a predictor. But what I see out there is name writing practice. And it goes something like this uh, in some instances. Teacher, child, small group. Okay, let's write, I want you to write your name, so let's practice your name. Let's just say the child's name is Brendan. Okay, what's the first letter of your name? I don't know. Okay, it's a B. Okay, and then maybe the name tag's pulled out, hopefully and you know points to the B okay so now you know you can write a B on your paper child I can't yes you can it's not that hard <laughs> okay now let's just talk about this motor representation you know lines and how they're composed and that is hard for preschoolers just look at their pictures their drawings and how you know so so what troubles me is I see what I would call quizzing situations instead of instruction. So I want somebody, you know, here's your name tag, the first letter is B, and I'll show you how to write that. It's a long straight line, not sticks. We don't need that kind of language, sticks and bubbles, get rid of that. Long straight line, and then a curved line, you know, and then I'll do that again, a long straight line, and you, and however, it can be wavy or whatever, and then, you know what. So, um, but I see children crying, Getting up from the tables, throwing pencils, yeah. that has to stop. The other thing I didn't say this morning is, again, if we go back to Gibson, this is a long way back, um, but she made the point, it's in 1974, in a Jean Shaw and James Carroll book, that writing letters is not a great way for the youngest child to learn letters. Comparison of letters, visual acquisition, now, I think there's some evidence that as children get somewhat older, that writing can help them sort of crystallize and, and learn letters better. I, I don't, do we have any research on that? Or do people, okay, I think we do, okay. But with the preschool child and the range of motor skills we have and how, how what a struggle it is, and I think we've got a lot of children who really are not playing with crayons and paper and writing tools and drawing tools. They're in front of the TV. It's not like the old days, the good old days, when, when children did have more of those raw materials. And uh, I was reminded a few years ago when I was at the lab school of how much it's the case that that kind of knowledge of action, my reflection and accounting for the action, is where that knowledge comes from. We had a child who um, his he was referred by his pediatrician, or said, you know, you need to see a speech therapist because his uh, language was delayed, although he did very well on a receptive tool, but he couldn't generate language. Anyway, the upshot was with all the um, evaluations, they found that his muscles in his chest and trunk were not as many fibers as there should be, and their arrangement was not what it should be. So he was weak. He had weak, and so he couldn't sustain sentence production because he just couldn't do the, you know. So anyway, he went to speech therapy and they worked on the breathing, and then he had physical therapy to work on the muscles and strengthen and so forth. So we had him as a three-year-old, and I remember that at a table, um, he loved construction toys. And his fine motor skills were great. He would prop himself on his elbows, because see, he couldn't sustain even in a chair, sitting very long. Prop on the elbows, 
and he'd make things out of Duplos and very skilled. He, um, we had to have a chair for him to sit on when, they, when the children were on the floor because he could not sustain, you know, staying upright. But I never thought about it very much that he never went to the writing table. You see, you can't write if you have to use your elbows to prop yourself up. He never painted at the easel, and as so many children do at the easel, particularly older three-year-olds, younger four-year-olds. I mean, alphabet letters are just another symbol out there, and they paint those big, just part of the picture. He never ever went there. <laughs> so when his physical therapist, um, and his OT uh, person, visited the preschool, oh, about March, of his four-year-old year because they were writing the reports that would go to the kindergarten. The kindergarten was getting on top of, of having him come in. And they asked him to write his name, um, the PT person, I guess it was the OT person when he, she was there that day. And it was just a scribble he couldn't. And uh, anyway, there was a big discussion about fine motor skills not being intact. And I said, you want to see him use his fingers with those Legos and he's fantastic. Anyway, the upshot was, because he really had not engaged in any writing or drawing, he literally did not have the cognitive knowledge that I think comes from, you know, if you, and I remember just my own child, I wish I'd had it on tape, um, but I, and he, because we wrote so much at our house, both my husband and I, the, the things he wanted were our pens and our pencils, and you really can't let a toddler walk around the house with those in his hands, so I would put him in his high chair. When I was feet, you know, and I, that's when I would give paper and marker. And I started that when he was about a year old. And I remember watching him and how I'd see him make a mark and look. And then he'd make another mark. And, and there was a point, he was about 16 months, he would try to repeat the mark that he had just made as if, well, that, I like that, I'd like to do that again. And, he, you know, and all that sort of control and knowledge of motor action and if I move it this way, it leaves that trace. And if I, you know, all of that knowledge that I think you get from that kind of exploration over years, um, a lot of our children don't have that <laughs> coming to us. So it looks simple to us for them to look at a bee and make a bee. It's not very simple to them if they don't come to it with, with that. So um, I'm seeing a lot of negative. <laughs> and I would, I would keep the initial learning in the visual domain. I mean, I have bingo with cards with six letters, highly confusable ones there. So we can, so I would um, use their first names and their first letter. I would, but I would do visual. Now, what they do at the writing center when they want to play around is fine, and they do. But I would not make children write as a way to learn alphabet letter uh, ID. You look at me kind of weird, Teresa, would you? <laughs> at pre in preschool? I absolutely would. You would, okay. But why? Well, first of all, there is, there is an additional modality. Yeah. It's like the accuracy and automaticity notion. Mm -hmm. They can know alphabet ID very, very well visually. Mm -hmm. But then, so when we think about them really using and appropriating alphabet letters, and one of the kids love those early writing experiences, being able to efficiently and easily write letters of the alphabet frees them to creating meaningful text and writing and expressing themselves more easily. So I think the critical pieces with it are and it depends on you. We do have to, it's sort of the whole thing, thinking about you know, individualization that we struggle with all the time in early childhood. Taking kids where they are or seeing that we need to help them move forward. So I think it becomes a matter of the appropriate kind of scaffolding. You need to have solid work surfaces. You need to have opportunities yeah. <laughs> for children to write letters. Very, I love those little whiteboards. Yeah. You need to give them some help in you know, understanding the sequence of strokes, tying the verbal language to it, and giving them limited, not repeated, repeated, practice, 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 yeah. they lose attention, but three to five practices. Some children will even ask you to guide their hand. Oh yeah. You know, that yeah. that's, yeah. so, it, yeah. and so yeah. for alphabet learning, they get the motoric representation. It really does draw their attention to those features of the letters and helps them with the discrimination problem. And I believe it also sets a, a foundation for the accuracy and automaticity of letter production that will enable them 
to use letters for purposeful writing yeah. sooner. And we do have a problem, say first grade, kindergarten as well, of the handwriting being so laborious and not automatic in any, any system to it that it does get in the way of composing. Now where I have the problem is with preschoolers um, who don't come in with any kind of uh, skill and they're holding the pen like this or the marker and I don't think it's necessary, uh, early in preschool especially, to have to do that. Now, I think you need to, uh, to watch, and I like to, in the lab school we did this, we had threes and fours mixed ages, and sometimes we would have some children who just missed the kindergarten cutoff, and they were adamant in the communities in Massachusetts. They don't want to look at you, they won't assess you, your child, we don't care who you are. You are waiting until you're five years old by September 1 before. And I can understand that because it costs money to assess. So the older children who had just missed kindergarten, and then some four year olds are quite competent, rhetorically. And they've had a lot of history of drawing, so they, they're pretty good in controlling lines they want to make, which is different from knowing an efficient way to compose letters that, that transfers across. You know, okay. So I think you put me, I would pick my moments and wh which children I thought were ready to get down to business of, of this. Because it is an issue. You don't want it to go too long with their... The other thing that OT people keep telling me, though, is whether it's grasp or whether it's forming letters, that as long as it's fast and legible, they don't care whether it's a standard um, motor plan. I mean, they, you know, they, but anyway, I do find children... So I, I agree, I guess it's the age issue with me. Now, the other thing I would like to suggest and I have no, see, we, we really need, any doctoral students in the audience? <laughs> we have so many dissertations that need to be done. Um, we, really, we really need some good information about some of these things. But on the, um, the discrimination and even the motor uh, sequence, um, and this came from the lead teacher in the lab school a long time ago because we had one little boy who had very bad uh, lead poisoning that was not diagnosed until he was three. And then he was hospitalized with the chelation therapy. And of course, as we know now, the damage is done. But he couldn't even remember what his name looked like as a whole. He, nothing would stick in terms of alphabet letters. And also, um, in those days, we did not have small groups um, that we assigned children to. There were some small group activities that you could elect to do. And so, so we didn't have too many options, she felt. And so she said, I want to think of something I can do with the whole group at circle time. That would be interesting to everybody. Of course, think mixed ages. <laughs> Uh, a middle and upper income population, basically. Um, but something that this child might also be interested in attend to that would help him with alphabet letter. Um, so she came up with this alphabet letter clue game. Does some of you know this? Because I, I think Susan Newman put it in the NUIC book, and so it's made its way around. Okay. Anyway, you, you say to children, you know, and this isn't appropriate until maybe the second or third month when they have some exposure to alphabet letters. Say, I'm going to play a game. And it's called the alphabet letter clue game. And I'm, I have a letter in my mind, and I can see it in my mind. And I'm going to give you one clue at a time. And I'll let you guess and see if we can figure this out. So let's say that the letter in my mind is E. So again, a white marker board is great or a piece of chart paper. So you say, OK, the first line, um, the part of this letter, is a long vertical line. Anybody have any ideas? Now, it's very interesting when children have some letter knowledge, particularly their own letter, because if my name starts with D, it's like, ooh, okay. And so you, you literally will get uh, responses. I think it might be a D. Now, rather than say, uh, no, it's not what's in my mind, which is the typical response of preschool teachers until you work with them on this, you say, I see what you're thinking, because when I make a D, I do start with a long vertical line, and then I put this curved line, and whatever. But, but D is not the letter I'm thinking. Anybody else have ideas? You entertain a few. You say, well, let me give you another clue. OK, second clue. I'm going to go all the way to the top of my long vertical line, and I'm going to make a short horizontal line at the top like this. Anybody have an idea? Now, preschool teachers in this audience, you see it's a long straight line. OK, what are the ones that pop out now? F, T, okay, I'm going to come back to that. There's another one. E might, although it's of low frequency. L, okay, L. P won't because it has a curve along. It's the next segment, okay. 
L is a big one because um, orientation is not a feature that young children have right away and apply to alphabet letters because in the real world, orientation doesn't matter. We could turn something one, you know, it is, they've learned to disregard it. Infants, by the way, under three months of age, in terms of visual stimuli, are sensitive to um, rotations and different, in different orientations. That goes away. <laughs> it's very interesting in infants. Uh, I guess they learn it doesn't matter. I mean, it's not useful until you come to alphabet letters. But anyway, so L is going to be <laughs> L is going to be a big choice. So then you say, oh, I see what you're thinking. So L does have a long straight line, and then it does have a short horizontal line at the bottom, not at the top. So it can't be an L. And then T, you know how preschoolers make their T's? Okay. Two lines, because from the visual perspective, if you look at it a certain way, that, that long middle line uh, goes right through. It looks like it's dissecting that top line. So yep. again, I see what you're thinking, and I, I used to say to children, and I've watched how you make your T's. And you do a long straight line, and then you put one short one this way, and one. but that's not how I make my T's. I do a long straight line, and then I do one short line that spans. But I know what you're thinking. So anyway, now we're going to get, so I'm going to give you another clue. So I do the next short horizontal line in F's, you know, yeah, F's. I said, it is. It is an F, but that's not the letter that's in my mind. Early in the year, and then you say, can you think of a letter that it could be? And early in the year, they're pretty stumped. Even kids who can identify E. Even kids who can identify E don't come up with E. But the minute you start drawing that last horizontal line, E, 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 okay? Now, that activity does several things. It models, which is not the same as a child going through the motion. I'll give that to you. And kids have to do their own actions. But it does model the actions and, more importantly, the strokes that make up letters, which is why I think stencils and dot-to-dots are useless and take us in the wrong direction. Because with those, we aren't dealing with segments and strokes. We're dealing with this dot to this dot, this dot to this dot. And with uh, stencils, you can fill in the lines any which way unless someone's standing over you and saying this one first. And the other thing is, to get the point of the writing tool inside the stencil, I've got to have my arm up. I want kids' arms to go down. For, for, you know, because the, the control's here early and comes down the arm. I want it to go down. I want to work against it. So anyway, um, so we can get at some of those things early through teacher demonstration that's very engaging. It's one of the most popular games among children. They want more. You know, you say, do another letter, do another letter. I think, I think they like the guessing part. And when you think about it, preschoolers are, I mean, they're very rarely positioned to think and solve problems because they don't know enough in most arenas to say, well, if this and that, you know. But when they get a handle on some alphabet letters, uh, they love the guessing game because it's probably one of the few situations where they can actually think and solve a puzzle. But anyway, now, meanwhile, the writing center would be open and kids should be encouraged to go there and they can draw and they can paint and you get some of those things. And then there comes a point when, again, individually, as I watch fine motor and whatever, in small groups, um, and what I, what I like, actually, in this classroom, uh, it became a small group option because the children started playing this clue game on their own. After, you know, so then the teacher turned in the small group, and she then would model, and, she would make, and then they got a turn to give clues with the teacher's help, which meant that she was coaching them on the strokes and the order, and then they were playing. So, you know, there does come a point, though, when we do have to get down to brass tacks. But I, for me, we've got to be careful in, with the preschool years in terms of demanding motor production from children who can't produce it motor-wise and also don't have images enough. And it's not a simple matter of copying, looking at the image and copying it. I was like, how do I do that? How do I put that together and diagonalize it hard? So I would, I'm somewhere, but I, I this, um, this issue of not enough automaticity in the handwriting by first grade, for example, getting in the way of composing is a big one, is a big one. And, um, but I don't know how to solve that early on without, without killing the interest in alphabet letters and writing. And I must tell you, it's interesting when I go to classrooms where there is a lot of handwriting 
in small groups instruction. Center's time, they're writing the center's, center's empty. It's not interesting to them. It's like they, they want to stay away from there. And it doesn't help when it's introduced as if you want to practice your name or practice writing the alphabet letters, you can go to the writing center. You know, what happened to the drawings? And let's remember, too, that writing um, in the end is really all about composing. So if you've got a child drawing, I don't want to go over there and look at these and say, well, what is it, and just write a few labels. No, well, tell me about it. There's always more story behind, whether it's the scribble writing or the conventional writing or the picture, because no preschool child, no kindergarten child could ever represent in writing or in pictures all the story they have to tell. So I like those situations for language as well. And then we can get to some of the writing, and I leave some to them, like some easy letters. And I might have my piece of paper. If they say, well, I don't think I can, look the S. It's so interesting. Oh, that's always the wrong way. So I hold the hand, say, and just that little nudge in the right direction, because that's what the problem is. Because if you go wrong in that first move, you've got a backwards S. So um, it does, I think the individualizing is extremely important. But I, I'm concerned about what I see in classrooms of children really, um, and it's not done well, and it could be done better. <laughs> I should say that, too. But kids really getting negative views of themselves and of writing and of alphabet letters if we're not careful here. So, um, yes. Can we get the microphone back there? I was just going to say I see so much tracing, which I think is not appropriate at all. I wouldn't trace either. I want strokes. I will model for them. I even do what I call targeted dot to dots. K's are so hard because of the line. So some a little girl named Christina, I can't get my case, and she was doing a straight line, and then you know, she start here, and kind of go like this. And so I said, okay, well, you know, do the straight line, and then I'm going to put a dot right in the middle of the straight line, as, as well as a dot out here where you're going to start to give them, you know, that's very different, that's a stroke. Very different from dot to dot to dot for the whole letter and the tracing, yeah. I, I, we can model and they can follow strokes. I mean, I, you know, that's useful. There's some children that I think we need to turn them loose at the running center to explore. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and there was someone back there, the, the man in the back row, yeah, we have the microphone, and then we'll come yeah, to you. Yeah, I just wanted to share it with you um, with regard to what you're talking about, the kids getting the negative feedback on writing their name. In one of my classes, I projected an um, image of a beautiful racehorse on the PowerPoint, and I let the students admire it for a moment. And I passed them out a blank white piece of paper and said, well, please go ahead and reproduce the picture that you see before you. And they laughed and giggled. And I said, no, seriously, mm -hmm. go ahead. And, yeah, you know, after they struggled with it for a while and shared their pictures, I said, now, why is it that your horse doesn't look like the one on the, on the screen there? And we talked about the you know, um, visual motor integration and so on. And mm -hmm. so I made the point to them that, you know, remember this when you're asking children to make a B and to make a C that for them, this is just as challenging a visual motor integration a problem as the one that you just faced. Right, right. And um, also you can tell, um, I mean, I know, I know a little boy who was the B who was struggling so much. And actually when he did make a B, he had the straight line. And then he did two circles. And they overlapped the straight line so that the straight line was almost in between them. And they overlapped one another. But he had all the components, mm -hmm. close enough for a four-year-old to start. You know, so I think, you know, and rather than that being close enough, it was, well, let's do another one because, because these curved lines have to be over here and not over here. But I'm always looking at what do they know, you know? And he, he knew a lot in terms of trying to do the B after the teacher had uh, modeled it. So anyway, but I like your example of, yeah, you just try it. <laughs> and the other thing. The lower case letters are so interesting. Um, I've seen children who make very long lines on lowercase a because they don't know lowercase d or b. You know, it comes back to the comparative. So, like, why can't I be a little sloppy and make that line? It's the same with lowercase n and h. You know, you only make the n line, straight line, short when you know there's an h that's going to be confused with. So, all this kind of. So, sometimes. Um, they could do it better in a way, but they don't know at the moment that it's important to. So anyway, yes? Um, a few years ago, there was some research out about um, children crossing the midline 
and starting close to their body and moving out, you know, and, um, rather than starting at the top and making other come down. And the whole idea about diagonal, um, about young children only seeing vertical and horizontal, not being able to make their body do diagonal if they tend to turn their head when they make a diagonal line so that what they see is is straight to them. Mm -hmm. They just readjust to the target areas are. So I just was wondering if that, um, do we still um, appreciate that research or has that come and gone? You know, I don't know that research, of that air, but I think some of it sounds like it might not be too accurate. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert in that area. But um, I, I, I will say this. Um, we do know in many cases that children see things perfectly well that they don't represent. Okay. And um, <laughs> this was a funny situation. Um, the, the Brandon little boy, who I keep talking about because it was such an issue, he has a lowercase d. And he wrote that backwards. So it was a B. And so the teacher said, you need a D, not a B. And so she wrote one. <laughs> she wrote a D. He looked at it and he said, that's what I did. Exactly. Because the orientation again, you know. And then she said, well, actually, you know, yours doesn't look the same way. And she did compare them, which was good. Um, but his initial response of, that's what I made. It's <laughs> so typical of a preschooler because orientation is. So I don't know, I think, I think we can get confused sometimes thinking they didn't see something. Because, I mean, the, uh, the D that she had made, the lowercase, was right there. He saw it. He saw it. But he didn't think it mattered how he oriented it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that research and the extent to which, but I, I, um, I do know the infant visual perception research, and I can tell you they can recognize diagonal lines <laughs> and variations in orientation of lines. So I can't imagine that. But see, I think the motor, you know, if, you're, if I don't make a diagonal line, sort of moving my body to kind of line with that is kind of a, I don't know, kind of a motor response of representing it. So, but I don't know what that means. I'm sorry. Anybody know that literature? <laughs> okay. We'll go to more questions. Yes. My question is more on um, functions versus the process of letter writing. Mm -hmm. And our California reality is there's not a single one of us in this room that does not work with English learners and yes. mostly dual language learners. Yes. And so when you give the example of the I'm thinking of a letter and it starts with a straight line, right away we have a majority of our group that would not understand that kind of an activity. Mm -hmm. And so in our latest DRDP review, uh, this was a point of reflection with my teachers, is we're doing very well with English learners and dual language learners in learning letter formation, letter sounds, mm -hmm. and letter names. Mm -hmm. Whether it's 10 or 20, 15, English, Spanish, whatever. It, it, the amount mm -hmm. of letters didn't matter. But where we're finding difficulty is in getting to when, when you were saying the, um, the alphabetic principle in the category versus the concept learning, is linking it to that concept and making sure that they understand the word in the rhyme or the song to which we're linking that initial mm -hmm. sound. Other than activities with their first names, we couldn't find a common denominator. And when the surf came to the turf right there in the classroom, that's what okay. we need to know. Now, just, just for your information, the classroom where I, the teacher made up this letter clue game and used it, and in many classrooms that have used it since, um, that particular year, and almost every year, there would be nine out of 18 children who were non-native English speakers. It was a, um, a very um, international, multilingual population. Um, so, um, and what was interesting about that population, and parents sometimes used to come to the office and they were very polite, but they'd say things like, I send my usually it was in broken English. The mother's English wasn't as good as the father's, who was usually the student. I send my child to your preschool to learn English, and my daughter is talking to so-and-so, so like another Korean child during play, they would be talking in Korean. 
So it was not uncommon. <laughs> How am I supposed to stop that <laughs> during playtime? But it's just giving you an idea of the, um, the population and all of the families would go back to their uh, native country. And so they were maintaining their, their native language at home big time, both reading and <laughs> speaking. But anyway, the population was very high uh, English language learners. Now, I would differ a bit in terms of the alphabet clue game being problematic because everything is demonstrated. So the teacher, um, where I think she might have improved how she did it was maybe to have shown some alphabet letters in the initial directions and say, I'm going to have you guess some, about some letters, okay? And, but once the demonstration started, the long vertical line, the curve line, it's all demonstrated and they soon caught on that this was, these were letters. And the ELL population, always fascinating, there were a high number of, uh, I mean they were from all over, Jap Japan, Korea, China, um, Ecuador, I'm thinking Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, Russian, Arabic, Farsi, I mean just, you know. Now these were academic families, okay. And I am quite certain <laughs> that the parents were also tutoring the children at home on English alphabet letters. Although they also were maintaining both um, writing and oral language of the native language. And I know the Chinese children, well I guess the Japanese and the uh, Korean children as well, the children were learning characters. That's no easy feat to learn Chinese characters. Um, and there are many of them, so they start that pretty early. So anyway, I don't, um, I don't think that particular task is problematic for ELL, um, you know, and, but see, I think <laughs> particularly also if your vocabulary and descriptions are elaborate and consistent day after day after day, but uh, some of the pronunciation was interesting. I remember one child who was playing it with a friend, and I said, oh, what are you doing? And I'm playing that game, and then it was vertical line. I mean, were, vertical was a little hard to utter, you know, vertical or something. So there would be those sort of phonological things, but, but it's a good point. I mean, always the e ELL. I, I have only worked in English immersion because the lab school is English immersion, and it was a population that they sent their kids to learn English. And by the way, I would say more than half of the English language learners were, were learning three languages. You know, the father would have, you know, the mother and father maybe met in grad school. So, you know, Hebrew, Greek, English, Farsi, Arabic, English, Hindi, Russian, English. And I used to just be absolutely amazed at how, now what you found was the language coming in would be dominant, the mother's language would be dominant because that's the, where they spent most time with. But if the father picked them up, they'd flip right into the other language. And then English became, um, if, if we had the children two years, uh, I think we had children who were truly bilingual who would just flip back and forth. I mean, so anyway, I, you know, I, I think we need to be careful on a lot of fronts. I think that particular game was, was, not, was not terribly problematic. For them, but yes. With okay. regards to letter formation, mm -hmm. I used to teach kindergarten and we would have the first grade teachers always coming back to us. Sorry. The first grade teachers would always share that we weren't doing a good job teaching correct letter formation. And our response was always, we don't want them to hate writing and we want them to be able to get their thoughts on the paper. And, and then as as the years went by, we were expected to teach them to write sentences. So if you're working on right. getting words out, you don't spend your time on letter formation. But now that I'm working with preschool, the kindergarten teachers are asking me, can you tell the preschool teachers they're not doing a good job teaching yes. that letter formation? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. And so when, and I know it's it's a developmental progression of do they have the motor skills to make the letter correctly or not, but how, you know, it's, it's a fluid, it goes back and yes. forth with yes. everyone pointing the finger yes. at. We just want them to get the concept you somewhere down the line can worry about <laughs> it. Yeah. And, the, and they, the people who, as the kids get older, those teachers always say, but it's so difficult to undo the it bad is. habits. It is. And, and back to what's going on here, it's both motor skill and it's internal um, visual uh,
pictures of the, of the letters. And that hit me square in the face when I worked, uh, Chelsea is a town that's north of Boston and it went bankrupt uh, with an state receivership and the schools were in very dire states. And our president at the time said, oh, Boston University, we'd be glad to run your schools for you. Anyway, it turned out to be a wonderful experience, but um, I dodged uh, the first couple of years of going out because I was already very busy and I went out for three years to do the preschool. Um, we started some preschool programs and so forth. But what was fascinating to me there was to see kindergarten children with perfectly good fine motor skill. And even preschool children, you know, by, I mean, I mean, hand on the tabletop, movement coming from the fingers. But it was a lot of scribble writing, a lot of mock letters, okay? And their problem was not motor. Their problem was no ideas. They didn't have letter knowledge in terms of knowing letter names and knowing their images. So I, uh, motor skill is an issue with many preschool children, three-year-olds, and many four-year-olds still. So, uh, and some of the worst examples I've seen of kids breaking down, all we can call it, is when I think, the mo well, they don't know the letter names either, but the motor skill copying is not very good as well. So, um, but anyway, um, I don't know where we need to turn the corner and who's responsible, but I will say this, I have a lot of um, kindergarten teacher friends. Um, and the lab school was a feeder school. We had Cambridge and Newton and Brookline, and I don't know if those names mean anything to you, but even those kindergarten teachers, fairly progressive group, would complain, kindergarten teachers, and the first grade teachers complained to them. But all I would say is just look at the, uh, look at the academic, and they would complain about the math as well. And they would complain to the kindergarten, because they had a certain math program that was very conceptual. And I remember my son's fifth grade teacher, I had the first conference of the fall, it was kind of late in the fall, and she was a terrific fifth grade teacher, experienced, older, fantastic. And she said to me, I've never seen so many capable children with so many gaps that I have to put together. And I'm telling you, she put kids together. But, <laughs> and in a great way. And they were ready to be put together, whether it was math or whatever. But I think there needs to be a balance. And I don't want to get overly concerned about the letter formation too early because what I see is kids hating writing and hating alphabet letters. And I just don't think we can do that. I do agree, though, that we can't go through kindergarten with, without, or even later in preschool for children who are ready. And we can work with them in small groups. And usually what I say to them is, I'm going to show you another way to make you know, that I think would be a little easier. <laughs> and then somebody, it's not easier. <laughs> My way is easier. But, you know, this will be easier. But, you know, but I, I, think, I think we need to be careful. So I don't have any great answers to it, um, except I do think we need to be careful and not turn children away from, from this area and not liking to go to the writing center. And I, I think. Um, Letter ID, letter name knowledge is the bigger issue for us. And I would like to get most preschool teachers off of the 10 letters that is enough. That's a bigger issue for me uh, than whether they can write the letters. Okay, so um, we need to get really busy on that front and not make that painful either. <laughs> okay, I think there were a couple other hands that now have gone down. Yes. I have a question regarding um, a strategy to bring attention to letter features, and I would really like to hear your response. Um, how do you feel about uh, utilizing, say, wiki sticks or something that's malleable so that the children can utilize those to move them to circles or straight lines? Uh, that's my first question. And then my next question is, um, if you don't like that particular manipulative, could you suggest another? Okay, good question. I don't particularly like those because I think they have their own motor requirements. I mean, it's not, you can, you can change them without having to erase and that sort of thing. So there's, some, but it's a long way around and I think we don't get to strokes. Um, in, strokes in the letters, okay. 
which is what I really, and not that kids will do it perfectly at all, but I mean, I think we don't want to put them in situations where they're going to completely ignore strokes in their sequence. One of the things I like are trays of cornmeal or salt or shaving cream and your finger. <laughs> See, get the tool out. I mean, nine-month-olds can do this, folks. Most nine-month-olds can separate the point. So if we get the tool, if we get the tool out of the way for a while, and I can just, and my elbow can be up, <laughs> and I can make designs, and I like to play around with children all kinds of designs, not just alphabet letters. Maybe we'll just do a zigzag. And the idea is, you know, and you can do a zigzag. Now you make a mark, I'll copy you. We're just playing. But getting the writing tool out of the way can really help some children. And we don't need the writing tool to get some of the uh, strokes and the sequence there. So I think the wiki sticks and other things, they are also are problematic. <laughs> and we don't need them if we, if we use these, um, these other ways. Um, I also am big on, and it, it happens spontaneously, but the easel, see, the great thing about an easel is I can use the muscle right up here. I can do things very, very large instead of a small piece of paper. So I think, um, and you will see, I mean, I don't see it too much anymore, actually. They don't even, they don't even paint letters. They don't like them so much. Um, but in the old days, I mean, you used to see paintings of, of letters mixed in with the little faces, you know, the drawings. And so I think easels are are great, um, you know, where they can, you can, you can go make letters there. You know, I say that to kids. So, and another thing that I don't like so much <laughs> are alphabet programs that tie a particular, say, animal or other, you know, because to me it's just, you know, and I have to remember it's alligator, not crocodile, for the A. It's just one more layer, and so I, you know, I think, I think if I had some children in kindergarten who were really turned off and we really needed to do something that was kind of cute and fun, I might, it might come to that for me to sort of, as my grandmother would say, gussy it up a bit. But, um, but we don't need to do that with preschool children. And it's just one more layer um, to, to uh, deal with. So I don't find that terribly helpful. What else? We probably have time for one more question before it's lunch break. We really do need a lot more good research in this area, though. We really do. It's, it's, it has not been researched very much because it's not as interesting to a lot of people as some other areas. And it's sort of like, well, you can figure out how to do this. But you know, for the preschool area, uh, you know, it's, it's not so easy to figure out kind of what we should be doing. We really need some good research in this area. OK, no more questions? I guess you have a, a comment before lunch? OK.